Hello everyone, this is Latia for you coming today with another scripture from the Lord. We are in Psalms chapter 10 verse 1 through 9 as well as Psalms chapter 19 verses 8 through 10. Let's go ahead and pray and we can get started. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for helping us to dig in your word and show us your ways, Lord God. Your ways are not like our ways. We love you. We praise you. We ask you to help open this up to us. Give us understanding and wisdom in what we're going through on a day-to-day basis and your character. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys, let's go ahead and get started. So Psalms 10 verse 1. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? So this is a psalm that is just pretty much describing the character of a ungodly person, right? An ungodly man and how he thinks the pride, his arrogance, and how he makes himself his own God, right? And he does not respect God. But this first verse basically asks, why is God standing far away? Why is is God not found in this situation where we're dealing with ungodly men? Um, Why can't we see his hand more clearly? Why is it that we feel like he's aloof to us in our situation at times? Um, And it says, why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? So when we're trying to pursue God and and seek after him in our dealings um, with maybe arrogant men, sometimes it can be hard to find God immediately, right? But the thing that I pull from this is that we have to have faith that he has heard our prayers, right? First of all, God... God wants us to seek him. God wants us to seek his face. He's a rewarder of those who he who diligently seek him. And he wants us to trust that he's heard our prayers when we call out to him. That's a part of our faith process, our faith building, and it helps us to trust in the Lord. Amen. All right. It says he will move when the timing is right. We have to know that he's going to move when he's ready to move. He knows the most opportune time to move. He is a God of timing. If you don't know about timing, read the book of Esther because it really shows how timing and the release of a thing and the doing of a thing should all be coordinated by the Lord and the Holy Spirit because they know the future and they know the most opportune time to do a thing. So we have to know that God will move when the timing is right. And then another thing that I put down was that he knows what's best for us. Um, And he's working all things together for our good. We have to know that even in our dealings with men who are um, not of God, who are holding us down, who might be oppressing us or oppressing someone, that he is working all things together for our good and he's bringing fruit out of us. He's causing us to bear fruit. That cutting process is causing us to bear fruit. We need to be prosperous. We need to be investing in our eternal future, right? Our reward is with him when he comes. So it's going to take sometimes dealing with things that are challenging. They bring forth the best fruit. Amen. All right. So it says, Even if he doesn't give you a blanket answer, he shows you that he is faithful over time. I was just sitting thinking as I wrote that, that, you know, a lot of times when you go through those, the most rough seasons, when you're dealing with very angry people or, or dealing with people that you just don't want to be around. He doesn't usually, for me personally, answer my call when I'm crying out to him. Now I feel comforted by him, but he does not send an answer to that situation usually immediately. It's through the process of time, right? It is through time that he shows his faithfulness. It is through over usually 
an expanse of building me and maturing me that he tends to answer my prayers, right? It's not necessarily some quick fix or or just eliminating the person who's giving me the problem. It's usually having to do with my growth and my understanding of his ways. Amen. So it says, why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? God hears you, right? And he knows what you're going through, even if you can't see his face. Verse two, in arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. So this is where it kind of begins to describe the wicked man, right? The arrogant, those who are um, in opposition to the Lord in his ways. And even if they're not conscious of it, they just are, right? So it says, in arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Why is it an arrogance? Because they are prideful, right? Arrogance um, here in the definition was pride, majesty rising up. They have puffed themselves up. They have lifted themselves up. They are the center of their own universe, right? So it says in arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. They are after their own uh, um, pockets their own pursuits, the things that they want. They are um, the motivating factor for themselves, right? And and the enemy is usually behind it. They think that they are the kings of their own universe, but they don't realize they're being influenced by usually spiritual wickedness or forces. So it says an arrogance of wicked, wicked hotly pursue the poor. And that wicked there is guilty, wicked criminal, right? So whether they they are doing something criminally to those who are poor or oppressed. And that poor there is poor, afflicted, humble, wretched. So they could be poor financially, or they could be poor in an afflicted state. Something is going on with them. They are afflicted. They are um, being subject to maybe that hostile person, um, the humble or the wretched, those who are low or those who are of low estate, right? And so they are subject to these people in these arrogant people, right? They are, um, they are the guilty, the criminals, the, the ones who are basically taking advantage of the position that they're in. So in that hotly pursue, um, just means burn, right? To burn, to hotly pursue, to go after someone. So it says in arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. So let them get caught up in the net that they are laying out for those people, those oppressed, those who are disenfranchised, those who are in need. Let that same net that they cast for them be the thing that catches them up, right? All right, verse three, for the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. So that wicked there means not ashamed of sinful nature, right? It they they are walking in their own ways. Um, it says, for the wicked boast of the desires of his soul, all he cares about is what his nefesh desires, right? His mind, his will, his emotions, his flesh, his his carnal nature. It's whatever he wants, right? So it says, for the wicked boast of the desires of his soul he has no um a shame he has no shame right he does not care um to know what the lord wants him to do right it says for the wicked boast of the desires of his soul he's going around telling others he's going around showing it off right and basically he is renouncing the lord um it says renounces and never give god credit for anything it says 
and the greedy one gains curses and renounces the Lord. So that, that greedy person. So these are two, these can be the same person, but there also could be two separate people. The wicked boasts of the desires of his soul. And then you have this greedy one because greed is wicked as well. So they, they're pretty much the same thing. So the same person, but it's saying that, and the wicked and the greedy one and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. So not only is he against God, but when he does receive something or he receives these, these, um, this prosperity, he doesn't give any credit to God. He doesn't, he doesn't go in the ways of God or say, Hey, wow, thanks in any way, shape or form. He is about himself, right? He is about what he wants, his wicked desires and his greed. All right, let's keep going. Verse four, in the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. So wow, his thoughts, his meditations, the inner turnings of his mind are all centered around the fact that he feels like there's no God, right? He 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 feels like he is God, right? And that's in the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. Um, the pride of his face um, or his countenance in the height of his scorn, he will not seek um, after God, right? So the, through like his head is so lifted up, his head is so prideful, he will not seek him, right? He will not go after the pursuits or even like question, right? So like most people you would think um, would get to a point and wonder at least is there is God there is he does he hear me does he see me but it, it's saying that in the pride of his face the wicked does not seek him all his thoughts are there is no God so he is operating in a way that is just in complete opposition to him verse five all right, his ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for his foes, he puffs at them. So it says his ways prosper at all times. Um, in order for a man's ways to prosper at all times, he has to be good at operating in certain systems. That's all, right? It, it, whether, you know, it be in the business world, whether it be in, in anything in the world, in the worldly ways of doing things, right? You have mastered a system. You have mastered some sort of um, way of doing things and you have uh, it has prospered you in some way right it says his ways prosper at all times your your judgments are on high out of his sight so in it because his way is prosperous you know it's he's blind right and he can't see the ways of God he he only sees basically the prosperity so he he's blinded by the prosperity but the judgments of the lord are on high the, the the lord is keeping track of of this person right he keeps track of all people we all have books in heaven right so he's keeping track of these things that are going on with the wicked man and he his judgments are on high out of sight the the man who's wicked can't see anything on high he doesn't seek after god so therefore he doesn't know god's ways he doesn't know how to pursue them. He doesn't know how to ask God what's going on with my account, right? So it's all out of his sight. And it says, as for all his foes, he puffs at them. He he acts as if, you know, no one can remove him from this position, right? And that's basically what the next verse says. Verse six, he says in his heart, I shall not be moved Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. Have you ever met a person that was so prideful? They act as if they would never die. They like that. That's not something they'll ever have to deal with. You know, we all face death unless you go through the rapture. But for the most part, everyone comes to that point. And to be arrogant enough to think that you will never face that, 
Um, and, and you won't have to give an account to anybody for anything, or you won't ever see a deathbed or a sick bed is very foolish, right? It's very arrogant. It says, he says in his heart, I shall not be moved throughout all generations. I shall not meet adversity. How many Kings have said that, right? I'm sure many Kings have said that to their people or at least in their heart. All right. So verse seven, the next one. verse seven, his mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and opposition under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. So his mouth is filled with cursing, deceit, I'm sorry, and oppression, not opposition. Sorry. So it says his mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. So his mouth um, is filled meaning that it is something that is is completely consuming um his words right out of the heart the mouth speaks the the heart causes the flow of the words to come out right so it says his mouth is filled with cursing right so that's putting others down in some way shape or form um having foul words foul language and then that deceit and oppression um meaning that he is deceiving people maybe he might be double-minded and saying one thing doing another um and then this oppression um he's causing the oppression of like through his words right he is putting down one and and pushing up another as if he's god right um saying that 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 this poor or oppressed person should be eliminated or oppressed more right so it says under his tongue are mischief and iniquity so under his tongue just meaning like a cherished place in the mouth so he 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 enjoys and desires the taste of mischief and iniquity right he cherishes it he holds on to it right he 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 is consistently operating in that because it is very highly desired by him in the same way that food would be desired or a really good tasting dish would be desired it's like he's eating ugliness and mischief and iniquity right um this steeped in evil um always trying to get in and do something and conspire against people that mischievous spirit so it says under his tongue are mischief and iniquity um ver- verse 8 he sits in ambush in the villages in hiding places he murders the innocent so it says he sits in ambush in the villages meaning that he's hiding away he is conspiring right um verse 8 uh ambushing the poor helpless those who are helpless and he's basically setting traps for them right it says he sets in am he sits in ambush in the villages in hiding places he murders the innocent meaning in under the cloak of darkness or under the guise of of mystery right he's he's killing people he's murdering people he's doing things that are not of god he is walking in a way that is not of god and so um it says hiding places he murders the innocent his eyes stealthily watch for the helpless so he's always watching and hunting in the same way that a hunter would hunt right his eyes stealthily watch for the helpless he's always looking for his next piece of prey right um those who are helpless those who are misrepresent are not represented right um Verse nine, he lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. So he has this net, this trap that he wants the poor to fall into, right? He's lurking in ambush. He's always watching. He's always waiting. And he's always ready to pounce on um, a person who is who is neglected and not represented a person who is who is in a disadvantaged position in the first place right so he is going to kick them when they're down um so verse nine you know 
verse nine is is really you know showing the character of uh, an evil person when you're when you're lurking and doing all these things against people you got to know that God is going to cause you to answer at some point in time for it and it's only a matter of time all right so Psalms 19 verse 8 the precepts of the Lord are right rejoicing the heart the commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes so this is the conflation here that God's ways are not like man's ways right when when man is walking in his own ways he's walking in a way of wickedness right he has chosen to turn his heart away from God but God's precepts are right rejoicing the heart the precepts of the Lord are right rejoicing the hearts causing us to be joyful, right? His his laws and his ways are, are causing us to live in a way that's right. It's pure. It says the commandment of the Lord, it's pure. The, the things that he sets for us to do and the ways that he wants us to walk are of purity. They enlighten the eyes, right? It says enlightening the eyes. So they are causing um, um, that word to, to cause us to walk in the light. And then the light is in us and they are enlightening our eyes and our understanding, right? Our understanding is enlightened because the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. So just imagine, remember the first verse that we came across where it says, oh, why, oh Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? He's not hiding himself. He's in you. His light is in you. That's where he is. It's not a matter of, of being able to find God in that moment. Yes, you can seek after God. You can seek his presence. You can praise him. You can rejoice in him. You can worship in him. And all those things are going to cause a flood of his light to be in your being and enlighten your eyes, help you to see, help you to see him in the circumstance, regardless of what the enemy is doing. The, the precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart hearts. The commandment of the Lord is pure. There is purity on the side of God, right? In, in, in the evil man, in his evil ways, those ways are just wicked and darkness, right? And they're only going to give a dark reward. They're, they're only going to get death as their wage, right? But with God, it's it's all light. It's pure. It's good. It's right. It's rejoicing the heart. Amen. All right. Verse nine, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true, the righteous and the righteous altogether and drippings of at the honeycomb. Mm, I like that. So it says the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. So the fear of the Lord, um, you know, we talk about it. It is the, the, the respect for God, right? The, of the sovereignty of God, of the truthfulness and the goodness of God. You're having that honor and respect and reverence for him, right? And that's clean. There's nothing dirty about that. There's nothing defiled about that. That is good. And you can feel it in, in your, your spirit, right? To fear God is a good thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, Thing that is going to cause uh, us to live forever. Amen. And it says enduring forever. It's always going to be right. It, that sovereignty for God. Why? Because he is God alone and he's always going to be in charge. He's always going to be over the universe and it's always going to feel clean because he's a good God. He's a righteous God. And so it says the rules of the Lord are true 
And so those are like, the rules would be like those commands of the Lord, right? Um, the way that we should walk, the what, the upright things, right? They are true. They are always enduring. They're, they're all, and it says, and righteous all together, meaning all right together, right? There's nothing that is wrong in him. There's nothing that is negative or down or not of of goodness, right? Not of purity. It's all pure with God. His ways, his rules, his righteousness. Um, it's all good. It's all good, right? It's all upright, um, all together. And that's why it's saying all, that's why I keep saying all of it. It's all together, right? All right, let me read that verse again. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether, and drippings of the honeycomb. So I just love that part because um, in some translations, it says j just honey from the honeycomb, but in the and drippings of the honeycomb, it just reminds me of, you know, when we're like baking a cake or something like that, and you have, um, the leftover after you've mixed or the bowl and you get to like lick the extra from the bowl, right? Because that that's the best part. Not eating the cake, not having the full of the meal. It's the drippings, right? That good, that good when you're not supposed to be eating that part, but you get it anyway. That that overflow. Um, one of the commentaries was saying that the drippings of the honeycomb are the most pure part of the honeycomb. And that's how his word is, right? That's how he is. That's how the fear of the Lord is. It's clean, it's pure, it's good, it's so sweet it is just right it's right all together and so and saying the fear of the Lord is clean enduring forever the rules of the Lord are true the righteous all and righteous all together and drippings of the honeycomb amen verse 10 more to be desired than than gold even much fine gold sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. So it says more to be desired are they than gold. What? The ways of God, the righteousness of God, the the um truth of God, the rules of God, the fear of the Lord. They are more to be desired than gold. Why? Because gold is going to pass away. This earthly gold is going to pass away. You can't take that with you into heaven, right? The only thing that you can take as far as riches into heaven is what doesn't burn up at the Bema seat. And that's something spiritual, right? So, and, and God is going to, if, if there is physical gold, or if there is physical fine jewels and all those things that they speak of, then that's going to take place later. You can't take what's here over there, right? So it's more to be desired, the, the fear of the Lord, the rules of the Lord, the righteousness of the Lord, and, and all those good, wonderful commandments and precepts from his word, um, then, then gold, then the things of this earth, even much fine gold, like the, the purest of the pure, it's more to be desired than that, right? Sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. So it is a sweet thing. His word is, it is a pleasurable thing. It is a good and a holy thing. And we should desire it. We should much desire it, right? More to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter than and honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. All right, you guys, let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this conflation. Thank you for showing us that your ways are not like us. Your ways are not like our ways, not like man, but help us to be found in you so that they can be our ways. Help us to be found in you so we can experience the drippings of this honeycomb, uh, of, of this honeycomb lifestyle, Lord God. Help us to enjoy the precepts of you and, and rejoicing in you and being in 
enlightened by you and your commandments, Lord God. Help us to fear you and feel that cleanness that comes from you, Lord God. Help us to walk in truth and righteousness all together, Lord Jesus. Only you can do that, Lord. Keep us from the ways of the wicked man, God. Keep us from from dwelling on that, but help us to dwell on the good things, the things that are of you, the things that are of purity and of righteousness, Lord God. We love you. We know that even when it looks like you're standing far off, you've got it under control. We put our hope and our trust in you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, you guys. If there's anybody out there who would like to receive Jesus as your Savior and Lord, go ahead and pray this prayer with me. But more than saying the words, believe them with all your heart as you confess them with your mouth. Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. I make you my Lord and Savior. Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and I believe you rose again on the third day so that I could be saved. Lord Jesus, Forgive me for all my sins. They are many. Sit on the throne of my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. All right, you guys. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you his children his peace. Take care.